Well, every other franchise has done it. May as well Doctor Who. Hello and welcome back to the Doctor Who Marathon. I'm your host, Mickey Dam, and today we're going to be talking about the 2010 Christmas special, A Christmas Carol, written by Stephen Moffat and is directed by Toby Haynes, and is inspired by the story, A Christmas Carol, originally written by Charles Dickens. Um, the idea of doing a remake, an adaptation of the beloved story of A Christmas Carol in which um, Ebenezer Scrooge is greeted by three spirits of ghosts of Christmas past, ghosts of Christmas present and Christmas yet to come, um, is a classic tale that a lot of franchise, you know, has inspired, you know, it has inspired a lot of films and also as well as a lot of episodes and a lot of other uh, a lot of other franchises as well to the point where it has become a sort of cliche to the point where it's usually um told as a sort of joke a parody when it's done by a particular franchise i remember that um a lot of people used to joke about star trek doing a christmas carol um and then Doctor Who just decides to do it. Um, so it's one of the most beloved stories in um, in fiction. It's one of the, you know, it's been told, you know what the Christmas Carol is. Everybody has seen at least a version of it, even if it's like the Muppets Christmas special or um, the one with Jim Carrey or the... The, the classic black and white one that I grew up with. So you're, you're all familiar with this story in one way. And that is also a problem when you're trying to adapt it yet again. Because it's a story that everybody knows off by heart. How do you make that interesting? How do you make this um, concept fresh? Well, luckily, we put it into a franchise where there's a madman in a box um, with a time machine that can go anywhere in space and time so we do can we can automatically we do have a unique setup for this adaptation um this is the first christmas special within the stephen moffat era and the first one to star matt smith um karen gillan and arthur darwell um who i'd like to point out now gets his name in the credits in the opening credits um Karen Gillan and Alva Darwin don't get a lot of role in there. There's mainly sidelines. You could even consider this a Amy and Rory light episode. So um, if you're a fan of those characters, you might be disappointed with their roles in this story. So, um, yeah, this is one of the, you know, this is, was a very, um, one of the very important episodes for the series. Um, in terms of its popularity. Christmas was always a big time for Doctor Who as a franchise. When it came back in 2005 um, with the Christmas Invasion. So, it and the fact now that this is in a Russell T. Davis one who popularised the idea of a Christmas special means that can this tradition continue? Can this tradition stay with... Um, uh, with the advent of a new showrunner and a new production. Uh, behind the scenes, there were a lot of changes from the, from the production from Series 5. Uh, basically, a lot of like the, the makeup department, the assistant productors and other people uh, were changed from the main series of Series 5, from the Christmas special. Don't know why. Maybe they were just setting up a new creative team for Series 6. Um, I'm not quite sure. So, yeah. Um, but does this story land? Does this story succeed in not only giving us a good Christmas special, but also giving us a great adaptation of the story um, of the story of A Christmas Carol, of a Charles Dickens' is Christmas Carol? Well... The opening pre-credit sequence is gorgeous, as we see. Um, the, yeah, one of the things about this story is that 
Toby Haynes just nails the the look of this story. They seem this clearly is some sort of of change in camera or change in some sort of production because uh, from this on out Doctor Who would adapt a much more cinematic look where um, with series 5 already having a massive change in how the series looked visually we have another boost in its visual style something which would continue on until um, right into the modern era so um that is just you know that's just a really cool um thing and it's just i don't it just looks really cinematic and toby haynes just really you could tell he loves the camera in this story and we open up with a ship crashing onto this um planet and you the cgi on the planet and then it like comes out of the to, to the view screen and we get a uh, Star Star Trek like ship environment, um, seemingly crashing onto the ship as it's crashed into the planet's clouds. We'll explain that later on. And uh, it turns out that somebody in the honeymoon suite is um, trying to get some um, signals out, trying to help with the ship. And it turns out that in the honeymoon suite, it's Amy Pond and Rory Williams dressed up like a policewoman and a Roman new a Roman soldier. Um, this is, uh, you know, Stephen Moffat playing into the whole um, kissy kissy part of his elements of his story in which, you know, he likes playing around with, um, I guess you call it sexy humour, where it's like, you know, you imply um, that, that something has happened, if you know what I mean. And um, they're basically calling upon the Doctor as the ship they're on is crashing, um, which they have gone on for their honeymoon. Um, and the Doctor then arrives and, and helps the ship to steer properly um, in a way where it's, it's still crashing. The ship is in this cloud, in this atmosphere, but it's... Still going down, it's still going down, but it's in, angled in a way where it'll take a while, at least an hour, before it crash lands on the planet. And that is our opening, um, that is our opening pre credit sequence. When we cut back, we get this amazing shot of this building with this beam like device hitting the sky as the camera goes out from this. Um, goes up from this building down into the village as we see um, the people of the village um, just enjoying this uh, Christmas-like holiday. It's, uh, it's established as not being Christmas, but Christmas enough that they can call, you could call it Christmas and nobody would mind. And they also have Christmas trees and, and they celebrate. Um, and... You hear this um, monologue in which we're talking about like how Christmas is this amazing time. We all cheer as if uh, we're halfway out of the dark, um, only for the narration to go sour of sorts as we cut into the big building and we get introduced to Kastren Sardek. Now, Kastren Sardek is essentially the Scrooge of the character of of the story um, he is the grumpy old man who must learn to be good his story here is that um, he has this machine which controls the clouds he has this machine that basically controls uh, what can get through what um, happens there's also um, uh, apparently fish as well and and he also holds people's families, um, family members for ransom. In fact, when we get introduced to him, a family, a poor family, had had just gone up to him and asked him, can he uh, return a family member for one day for Christmas, uh, to which Sardik um, completely denies. And so um, he tells his uh, people to 
get the kids out. He gets a phone call from the president of the planet saying, right, there's a ship crashing. We need to get this cloud. Um, we need you to turn off the cloud so that the ship can land safely. As Sardik is just like, um, uh, tough, as he hangs up the phone and the doctor starts spiralling out of the chimney, introducing himself in such a wacky and charismatic way with um, Matt Smith just completely loving this new cinematic style. You can tell he is so comfortable in this role and that he's so jumpy and energetic. And I love how, and what makes Matt Smith's Doctor so great is how he can switch from being this charming and charismatic Doctor to the darker elements of the character like that. And it feels so smooth. There's a great bit where he's talking to a kid about Father Christmas and how he's real. He shows him a photo of, of him with Santa and Frank Sinatra and Albert Einstein. And he's like, I keep the faith. And then he points out to the woman in the, in the frozen uh, cabinet, to which the doctor points out, um, to which Sardik is just like... Um, uh, she's a uh, she's nobody. Uh, uh, she's a nobody. Uh, at least she's not important. And the doctor's like, that's amazing. Out of all of my years in time and space, I've never met anybody that's not important before. Um, uh, the least bit important before, which is kind of funny because he said the exact same words um, about them about a person being uh, completely um, not important to Donna Noble. But I guess then she did become important to him, so um, maybe that's rectified. But um, I don't know. I just find that really funny. And so um, the Doctor gets cut, cut off by Sardik's men to basically chuck him out. But the Doctor basically promises, I'm not going to let anyone die and I'm going to stop that ship from crashing. You're going to help me. I'm going to find a way and you are going to save those people. And, I make, and I'm making a promise that the Doctor then leaves voluntarily. Now, let's talk about Sardik, um, Kastran Sardik. The, he is played by the legendary Sir Michael Gamba, uh, Gambon, who you might remember uh, playing Ga uh, Dumbledore from the Harry Potter films. I believe he was introduced in Prisoner of Azkaban, which oddly enough is the only is the first one that involves time travel at one point in, this, in that film. So that is, uh, that's pretty funny. Um, and then he plays um, the character until his death in The Half-Blood Prince. And as well as like his ghost form in um, The Deathly Hallows, which uh, actually hadn't aired yet, uh, actually hadn't been released yet. So um, the film was at its height and Michael Gambon was a massive star. So it was a huge deal that he was in a Doctor Who. And it wasn't just like um, a minor role either. He was essentially the main character. Like I said, he is the Scrooge of the story. But his character here doesn't make a lot of sense. We um, we basically learn a little bit about his character, but um, we basically learn why, in a sense, why he's grumpy and why he's moody. However, why does he want the ship to crash? Like, with Scrooge, let's take it back to the Christmas Carol, and this is why... Um, this adaptation kind of fails is that with Scrooge it makes sense you know he's a businessman he thinks more about business and uh, the reason he doesn't give um, his staff days off for Christmas is because he thinks more of profit though he does hate Christmas um, uh, it's all about it's more the fact that he can't see the point of Christmas so it's like why should you get a day off uh, why should you, um, why should we bother? And 
the and though the, the concept of Christmas just kind of annoys him because he he kind of feels like in his elderly age um, that it's just an excuse for people to uh, to get a day off and and enjoy themselves and and spoil themselves for no reason whilst he is much more methodical and much more uh, logical thinking and we later learn throughout the story that there are roots into his back into his history on why he thinks like that in this story we do get a um, like a sort of origin of why he is such this this grumpy uh, character however grumpy enough that he would let millions die technically by his hand um just doesn't work i don't think you already have the concept of him holding people essentially prisoner um as for people to basically um pay their rent he's basically this like um a bank owner and when poor cup poor families can't uh, basically pay their bills he essentially just takes a family member as insurance which does make him a grumpy sort of a character but makes it I kind of think I think I might have taken it a little too far and it makes this character seem so unlikable that I don't think he the story starts off with him even being deservant of being saved of being uh, rescued that when the story tries to justify his actions and tries to and tries to uh, turn him into a good character later on it just doesn't feel um doesn't feel natural it just seems like you know he's such an at the bastard but it's because he is because though you know there's there's no real root into why he would want to kill a bunch of people um, let or at least let the people die crashing on a city that he essentially owns it you know it doesn't make a lick of sense really but let's talk about something I do actually kind of like about this adaptation because usually when we get an adaptation um, for example a Christmas uh, the Muppets Christmas special is that usually they just tell the story as if you know these characters are going through these adventures without any knowledge of the original story however here we actually get the doctor and amy discussing about uh the concept right we need to get a turn this grumpy man who's the only person who can save the day and turn him into a nicer person so that he could change uh, so he could change and turn into this person who would want to, to release the beam and uh, music starts playing in the background and when Amy can't hear the doctor and asks her attack asks him what that music is the doctor is just like a Christmas carol it's a Christmas carol a Christmas carol and it clicks in his head it's like oh Sardic you're gonna have, have a very important um, uh, Christmas and a Merry Christmas to you. Um, which basically, so if you don't understand, the Doctor essentially has the idea of a Christmas carol because he has knowledge of the original story. He's met Charles Dickens, for crying out loud. So essentially, he's inspired by the story to try and get this person to become a nice guy and he essentially becomes the ghost of christmas past um as um he comes into sardik's room and he does this kind of sherlock thing where he looks around the room to try and find out why sardik is the way he is and he comes to the conclusion because of the chairs which are all facing away from a particular painting from a person that looks like um, Castran Sardic, however, it's not. The date is all wrong. It turns out it was his father that he looks identical to, because he's also played by Sir Michael Ganton, uh, Gambon. And the Doctor essentially opens up this um, 
this history file showing Castran as a young boy basically vlogging uh, on his computer and we see his father hit him um, oh I forgot to mention uh, in an earlier scene he goes to hit the boy Castran uh, only for him to pause just before he hits the hits the child and, I, and that's the that, is, that scene is used as the doctor's um, inspiration on how he's not a completely terrible person. Um, and so he tries to use that moment to try and get find out the root of why he's not a not such a bad guy but would still do this. So his fa we basically learn his father is this also like a grumpy character who, who basically abused his son um and to try to become a much more uh business like person and here we get a controversial element to the story because when this story came out it was heavily criticized for not sticking to the established rules of doctor who as the doctor actually goes back in time and goes and meets um, Sardic, uh, Sar Castran Sardic as a child, changing history right in front of Sardic's eyes. Now, in Doctor Who, it's established before that you can't actually do this. You can't go back and change somebody's personal history like this. Also, as well, the Doctor usually doesn't have complete control of the TARDIS. It's very strange in this story how the Doctor seemingly lands uh, exactly where he needs to be, um, seemingly having full control of the TARDIS. Um, however, I think over time this element has been softened um, with uh, many other stories doing a very similar premise and the fact that it's not really important and you can... Um, you can just turn off your brain and just go, it's a Christmas special, it's supposed to be dumb and stupid. Um, and yeah, if that bugs you, if that bugs you that it doesn't uh, follow the originally established laws of the, of the programme, um, I think that's fair enough. It did bother me when I first uh, watched this, but I think over time, to me personally, it has softened up. And then here I think the story really takes... A downturn because the story starts focusing on flying fish and what really kind of bugs me in this scene um, in terms of storytelling method is that the doctor is essentially doing this for Sardic to try and see the the fish because um, he basically explains at one point that he never saw a fish because there was a fish attack at his school, but he was off sick. So every, every kid in his school had seen the fish, except for him. And because of the cloud thing that his father's machine, um, the, cloud, the fish usually stay above um, the skyline, above the clouds. However, there were moments where they do come down. So... Um, so the Doctor basically sets up this uh, trap so that he can capture a, um, a little fish. What really bugs me about this scene, um, which bugged me when I first watched it, but now re-watching again, I don't know why it really annoys me, is that this scene is supposed to be this like, oh wow, this is a really cool moment for um, Castor and Sardic. However, the Doctor opens the door, sees the little tiny fish clearly thinking it's completely um, innocent, um, but keeps the door closed and Sardic never really gets to look at the tiny little fish at this um, and have his, wow, this is really cool moment. It's mainly focused on the Doctor and his experience. And I feel like this is where um, you can clearly see the issues in this story. It's supposed to be a personal tale between um, of Castro and Sardic and why he's become a grumpy character. You know, it's the it's an adaptation of a Christmas Carol. However, despite that, 
the story seems still focused more on the Doctor. Though Castran, the younger Castran, essentially becomes a companion, the story seems to take um, moments that should belong to him. For example, this, um, this awe-inspiring moment where they look at the flying fish and give it to the Doctor, which is great, you know, it's cool, you know, it's, you know, the Doctor, but it's Castron's story. It should be him um, learning and experiencing and going through these emotions. Not the Doctor. It's, it's Castron's story. It's taken away his element of the story and given it to a character who the story shouldn't be focusing on here. If that makes any sense. And so the Doctor... Um, he gets, um, he's like an artist, this fish, only for it to be bitten and get an inside uh, Castron's bedroom is a giant flying shark. The CGI on this just looks utterly horrible and the, there's nothing, it doesn't feel any uh, danger that the the concept of a flying shark just feels extremely dull and uninterested and feels really really stupid the whole concept of the flying fish was pretty silly to begin with but the fact that one of the monsters is a flying shark is just really dumb <laughs> it's just a really dumb it's just a really dumb concept in my opinion. And so um, um, they fight it, it gets uh, choked on the Dr. Sonic screwdriver. We get a scene then in which like it's like smashing into the into the ward into Castron's wardrobe. Um, the doctor tries to get his sonic is like um, right okay I need to find my uh, sonic screwdriver. Good uh, good answer is that it's in arm's length, and so he t goes into the uh, shark's mouth. Well, he, you see him build it up for it, only to cut to them outside Sardric's bedroom, and the shark seemingly is dying. But um, uh, the doctor can't save it unless it um, stays in an ice, um, ice environment, a frozen, um, in a frozen box, which Castran is like. I I've got them. I could go, I could go um, get them. My father's got a bunch of them downstairs, and so he goes downstairs to try and find one. And this is where we find out the uh, that he's actually got hundreds and hundreds of people that he's frozen, lots of family members taken. We then get reintroduced to Abigail, which is the the girl that was frozen at the start of the episode. Um, Abigail then gets uh, introduced and calms the shark by singing, and and uh, that's spent. And the, she becomes a good friends with the Doctor and Castran. Now Abigail is played by Catherine Jenkins, a famous Welsh. Um, I don't know. Would you call it opera singing? Uh, she's got very like um, uh, that kind of like. Opera. So I don't know if you could count it as opera, but it's opera-like um, in her in her style. And this is actually her acting debut and continues on from the tradition of Billy Piper and... Um, what's her name? Um, what was the one from Voyage of the Damned? Um, Kylie Minogue as famous pop stars turned actresses in uh in Doctor Who and Catherine Dickens I think does a really good job here she's usually I usually hear people criticizing her performance in this story I think it's more the fact that Abigail just isn't an interesting character she is only there to use as a plot device and is only there really to not just to keep the music calm so that uh, the threats can be um dissipate and also as a love interest to Sardic. But it's so obvious as to why she is in the role. 
and she doesn't really have much of a character other than she misses her family and she's uh, seemingly ill. Uh, does and there's, you know, there's nothing really much of her on that. Her voice in this story is amazing. Her, the music, when she sings in the story, it is utterly gorgeous. Speaking of the music, Murray Gold here has stepped it up a notch. Um, it's here that he really pushes the I am the doctor um, theme, the doctor, I am the doctor like motif. Um, as there are many bombastic renditions uh, in this story and multi like it plays throughout I think majority of the story but it's so good I'm so glad that it's such a great tune that you can listen to it for the majority of the story and it doesn't feel forced it doesn't feel in your face it does genuinely heighten the mood and atmosphere of the story and gives it this really um bombastic feel so Murray Gold here and Toby Haynes no issues here they are absolutely on top notch Catherine Denkins uh character might be a bit dull but I think her performance is uh completely fine as she gets basically she has to be frozen um back frozen and Sardric promises to see her next Christmas Eve as she basically explains that the doctor uh, comes every Christmas Eve. I love how the doctors every, like. I love the the edit of the doctor just going. Hold on, wait, no, I don't. No, no, no. The door closes. It opens again. Merry Christmas. Um, and we see this montage of our characters basically going through all these years, all of these Christmases together with the doctor in its time machine going to uh, the past, the present, and the future. We also get a lot of cut um, uh, cut-ins with uh, the elderly uh, Castor and Sardic, basically remembering these new memories. As as um, we basically get this, it's basically just like you know, it feels like a very self-contained little um, little moment in the story. Uh, we also then have. Um, we also see like a teenage, a young man version of Castran who takes a liking to Abigail and they kind of um, fall in love and it's incredibly dull and uninteresting. The, the characters doesn't seem to have that much um, in common, that much, um, that much in like and it seems like the only reason Abigail takes a liking to Sardic is because she just so happens to, to meet him at a bunch of parties back to back to back to back to back. So, yeah, and the only reason really Sardic kind of likes her is because she seems pretty by the looks of it. And so, uh, Sardic basically becomes invested in this character. However, he finds out that she is ill and he becomes a much bitter character um, and actually turns his back away from the Doctor, essentially stating that um, we don't need to have these Christmas parties anymore. Let's forget about, um, let's forget about next year. Um, Christmas was for kids. I'm a grown man now. As he essentially starts taking a business from his father. But um, his father basically gives him the cloud machine. Um, Sardic considers taking the, the sonic screwdriver to let the Doctor know what's happening. I love that shot where the Doctor's outside the window. Some of, like, some of the directing here is utterly gorgeous. If there's one thing you can't fault about this story is how the story looks. And so, and there's a great bit where they kind of look at each other through the window and Sardic kind of looks at the Doctor and he kind of puts all of these negative emotions of, of Abigail on uh, the doctor and closes the blinds, puts the sonic screwdriver back and takes over the family business still. Something has clearly gone wrong here. Now, this would have been actually a great motivation for him later on in the story to be in such a grumpy and miserable get. Is that, you know, he had this chance, this, this woman he loved um, however, the moments he took and had been taken away from her 
that does is kind of used later on um, as his emotional hook on why he would let people die. Um, you know, it's like he only gets one because of the frozen thing and there's this counter that counts down. Because of it, she only now has one day left to live and he keeps her frozen in suspended animation so that she doesn't die. And he kind of sees all of these people as it's like, why do they get to live and why my beloved gets to die? However, the fact that we firmly established that this is time changing, how history has been rewritten, this can't be the same um, goal that he had at the start of the episode. And so the emotion, the feel of this story is kind of twisted in a way where it really just doesn't work on a, on a building blocks of how a story uh, should be told. So then uh, quickly, essentially, we get the ghost of Christmas present as Amy Pond appears to Sardic as a hologram and essentially introduces him to the crew of the ship and they all start singing Christmas carols to try and give themselves hope. The... Um, the ship seemingly um, is crashing, but the captain and the pilot have not told the crew um, that whatever they're doing just isn't working. So they're singing um, and basically hope that uh, they'll be saved by somebody who's listening, uh, like Castran. But Castran basically explains to Amy about his uh, how. Uh, Abigail only has one day left and her has to pick and uh, we get this uh, line that's in like, all the trailers where it's like um, time can be rewritten people can't um, and that line is uh, is essentially a, like a ground hook to the, to the story but that's all really all Amy gets to do and I feel like as well the story was written pre- Rory being a main character because literally all he does here is butt in in a few scenes and then uh, leaves and that's basically Rory Williams in A Christmas Carol which is really disappointing because I love Arva Darwin and then um, the story has uh, the doctor essentially promising that the ghost of Christmas yet to come. As Sardek is like, basically insults the Doctor in front of his face. It's just like, I'm not like you. I don't want to be like you. Do you know why I want to kill those people? It's not because I want to. It's not because I have this grand plan. It's because I just don't care. And the Doctor's just like, I don't believe you. But um, is this the person you want to be? I'm showing your future now. And he turns around, Sardek to reveal that the Doctor had taken the child version of Castran to see his older self and Castran goes to hit his younger self um, and he gets flashbacks of him hitting the boy uh, of him being hit by his father um, that boy who she didn't hit and all those great memories um, with Abigail why did he go to hit his younger self? That's supposed to be like the main emotional, oh my god, moment. But I'm just there thinking, why did he do that? Why did he go hit his younger self? There is no emotional or story, no, yeah, story reasons, but there's no emotional hook or emotional reasoning why he would do that. He just goes to try and hit himself and then, oh look. The morals, I'm actually a good person after all. Um, so they, so because of him not hitting his younger self and he apologises for scaring his younger self, he then decides, okay, I'm going to change the device so that it will save the, the ship. And they go to save the ship. However, the machine isn't working because of the, the person has changed... Um, his father wouldn't have given him the access to the machine. So now because of that, he doesn't have access to the machine. There's one way how she can calm 
um, the crystals calm the, the, the fish so that they will, um, so they will stabilize and have the ships be saved. And the doctor turns to um, Castro and is like, I'm so sorry, but we're going to have to let her out. We need her to sing. And this is another moment where the emotional hook, the emotional grab of this character gets completely ripped out. Essentially, he stands there looking at Abigail in her ice coffin, essentially, and is debated whether to open or not. It's like, if you only had one day left, would you, which day would you choose? Would you do it? Would you let them die? Um, um, even if it's for a good cause? But the story completely ruins that by the fact that Abigail somehow just lets herself out. Castron doesn't even make the decision here. It's Abigail who lets herself out and... She just kind of has no problem with it. She doesn't even seem that concerned. And so she sings this song. It's, um, uh, it's a gorgeous song. I can't remember. I think it's just called Abigail's Song. Um, it's on the soundtrack. Uh, highly recommended you uh, check it out. It's a really uh, beautiful piece of music to which she comes to fish in the... Uh, they basically established earlier on that it has something to do with these crystals in the air, which the singing harmonizes and cools down the, the clouds. And so the ship can, to, can land safely and, um, and everybody, the doctor meets up with um, Amy and Rory and they basically are just like, oh yeah, how did you have fun? Um, also, I need to point out something. Um, it turns out that the Sarah Jane episode, The Death of the Doctor, actually takes place chronologically after this, as the Doctor explains that it's going to take him to, uh, on a honeymoon, uh, a moon made out of honey, which is something he has established has been doing in Death to the Doctor, a story which I've already tackled, because I got a mixed, I didn't realise that um, this story actually takes place first, so... I've kind of messed up on that part. Um, I do apologise. I've messed up. Uh, oops, the daisy. Um, but yeah, so Death to the Doctor actually takes place after this story. My bad. Um, and we get a really stupid visual to end the story on with Castran and Abigail flying um, the shark uh, in the sky as they have to spend their final moments together. And that is... Doctor Who's Christmas Carol. Overall, it's not very good. The story looks gorgeous. The music is top notch. Matt Smith, uh, Catherine Jenkins, Michael Gambon, the uh, the kid and the young man that play the the younger versions of Castran, all give themselves um, a fantastic job. Give me all sides a tap of back. You know, there's a lot to like here. However, what really fails is the writing department. The story is all over the place and seems to have very little understanding of what makes the original story so great. It completely messes up and is sadly a precursor to just how the Stephen Moffat era just doesn't have good Christmas specials for the most part. It's one of the things that a lot of people criticise uh, the Revived series for, but mainly the Stephen Moffat era, is that the Christmas specials aren't that very good, and this is just a bedrock for that kind of opinion. The If you're somebody who does enjoy this story for the visual style, for um, the acting, for the music, I completely see that, I completely understand that. But I feel like purely on a script and a purely on an adaptation of a Christmas Carol, I feel the story works so little that it just completely dumbfounds me and it just really, just feels really dumb and really silly and really stupid and it takes away from the emotional hooks 
that was supposed to be from Castor and Sardek, but gives them to the Doctor in certain scenes. And at the start, he makes them so unlikable that I honestly don't care if he gets his happy ending. I hoped he didn't get his happy ending. He's the villain of the story. He is the bad guy. He didn't deserve the ending he got, in my opinion. But, yeah, that's A Christmas Carol. Overall, it's not really anything noteworthy. So join me next time where Rani and Clive find that they are the only people on Earth. So join me next time for The Empty Planet. And I'll see you next time on The Doctor Who Marathon. Ta-da!